turn to plate 21, where we'll talk about axonal transport, microtubulars, and molecular motors. When we started talking about movement of solutes and solvents, we were talking about diffusion bulk flow. And I've already hinted with axonal movement, the idea that vesicles of filled with acetylcholine are attached to these filaments, the proteins that are involved in the movement of these vesicles to the end of the synapse, and this idea of transport of material within the axon. On, on number 21, um, plate 21, you're talking about axonal projections that can go from the spinal cord down to your big toe, right? So that's a meter. That's a long way to have things manufactured in a cell body and transmitted, or transported rather, down to the end of the foot. Now the action potential moves very fast. It's an electrical signal. It moves very rapidly in the order of milliseconds. That's not true for the transport of materials within the axon. Proteins, vesicles, acetylcholine. The time required for diffusion of even small proteins over one meter would be on the order of 150 years. Right? So right off the bat, you say, simple diffusion is not going to help. How, how do things get transported? So for that, we find a subcellular structure called microtubules. So microtubules are, are uh, tubules made up of what are called protofilaments. And here is a, a nice diagram of one of these uh, uh, proto, uh, um, protofilaments right here that then uh, combine to form a, uh, a protein called tubulin. tubulin. These microtubules are found throughout the length of the axon. So it's a, it's a, a characteristic structural component of the axon. Well, in addition to these microtubules are a couple of motor molecules, molecules which move along this microtubule. So you think of the microtubule as being kind of the track structure uh, within the, the axon and the motor molecules as being the locomotives or the transport mechanisms. And there are two basic groups of, of motor molecules. One are the kinesins, and the other one are the dienes. So if you look down here in the middle of plate 21, they talk about these two groups of motor molecules, the kinesins and the, the dienes. They respond differently based on charge, so they tend to move in opposite directions along the, the microtubules. Dienes take compounds back to the cell body. So um, nerve growth factors, which are produced, uh, which are which are picked up in, in the axon, can be can be transported back to the soma by the the dienes. The uh, kinesins are involved in transport from the cell body down to the synapse. So, right, we've, we've manufactured the acetylcholine and the vesicles up in the cell body. We need to transport them down to the synapse. How do we do that? We use these motor molecules. Both of these processes are ATP requiring. So it's an active process. It's part of the business of doing neurotransmission. Um, there's another family of uh, motor molecules, and that, are, that is characterized by the myosins. Uh, 
I've already mentioned actin. Actin it was one of the filaments involved in, in vesicle movement in the synapse. Uh, myosin is also a contractile protein, and we're going to put those together in the next lecture to make muscles. So the elements of contractile elements, the elements of contractile function, the myosin and actin, are present at very small molecular levels, even within the axon. And throughout a number of animals, these serve as mechanisms to move compounds from one place to the other. So let's look at a very organized structure of actin and myosin. And for that, we're going to do muscles. So if you go to plate 22, two major categories of muscle, smooth and striated. We're going to focus first on striated muscles. Stria from the Latin meaning furrow because under the electron microscope, what histologists would see was an alternating light and dark section. So it looked like furrows in a field and very organized structurally. Well, let's start with the big picture and let's start with a muscle. So here's the biceps muscle. It is defined by a layer of connective tissue on the outside. And if you section through it, you will find that there are subsections defined by connective tissue consisting of bundles of muscle fibers. This, uh, when we talk about bundles of fibers, the term fascicle is used. So the fascicle is a bundle of these fibers. And each fascicle is defined by a number of cell, muscle cells. So a fascicle is made up of many muscle cells. This is a muscle cell. It's defined because it has a, 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 a membrane over it. It is multinucleate. In, in the, the, the prenatal stage, in the embryonic form, these cells are individual cells with single nuclei. There is a fusion that occurs with development. So at birth, these are then multinucleate but the nuclei are relatively confined to the periphery. Most of what occupies this cell uh, is a collection of smaller fibers. So we're going to define a muscle fiber as an individual muscle cell. So it has a mem cell membrane to it. In a classic cell, we could call this the plasma lemma. In a muscle cell, we refer to it as the sarcolemma. So whenever you see the prefix sarco, that refers to flesh or to muscle. So the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane surrounding the muscle cell. And as we will see, it has some properties that distinguish it from the run-of-the-mill plasma lemma. Okay, so the sarcolemma defines the cell. There's an, it's a lipid bilayer, there's an extracellular, intracellular, but within the muscle fiber, we see these myofibrils. The term fibril refers to a definitive, a diminutive myocell or muscle cell. So each muscle cell is composed of a myriad of these smaller myofibrils. The myofibrils consist of an interdigitation of two of our molecular motor proteins, actin and myosin. Uh, myosin is the thick filament. It's the larger of the, of the two molecules. Actin tends to be thinner. Highly ordered, highly organized within the cell. And this section shows you the arrangement end-on and the relationship between the thick filaments and the thin filaments. 
each thick filament is oriented so that there are six fil thin filaments around it. So if you had to do an elegant model, if this was a thick filament right here, it would be surrounded by six thin filaments. Very careful organization. You see that, it, that it's very, very organized. If you look at this thing end on, what you see is this arrangement down here. Alternating areas of dark and light. At the microscopic level, you don't see this much detail. All you see is light and dark areas, hence the term stria or furrows. So you can see, and you'll, see, and you'll see this in lab very clearly. The, the original uh, anatomists that were defining this really didn't know much about actin and myosin. They didn't know how they functioned. All they knew is how they transmitted light. And in some cases, they didn't transmit light. There was an anisotropic region. And there was a portion that transmitted light, or an isotrophic. So an means without, iso with, light, without light. Well, let's shorten that into A bands and I bands. So in this diagram, dark here to here. Now, there's more detail in this because this is, this, is, this is more likely what you'd see in an electron microscope. But in a scanning light, or in a, in a regular light microscope, this area was relatively dark, so that was referred to as an A-band. And then there were I-bands. Well, as resolution got better and better, we came to recognize that there, in fact, was an area that was in the middle that was not as dark as the end, and this was called the H-band. And then a line of dark that was, that was between the A-band. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the middle of the I-band, between the A-bands, the German for in between is called Zwischen, so these are called Z-lines. So A, I, H, and Z are all German. The German anatomists were de describing it, so they kind of put their appellations on this, and we, we still refer to them as A, H, uh, I bands. Well, what happens? Uh, what do we know about contraction of this muscle? So historically, what would happen, kind of like with the nerves, is a section of muscle would be f fixed, an electron microscope be taken, and then uh, you would contract it, fix it. So we had muscles at different levels of contraction that were fixed. And what we saw was a change in the, the banding pattern. And that's demonstrated in the bottom of plate 22 right here. The anatomist described a, 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 a unit, functional unit of this myofibril as a sarcomere. So again, sarco meaning flesh, meaning mere meaning uh, like uh, measurement or portion. And the sarcomere was then defined as the area between the Z-bands. So this is one sarcomere. If I could draw it a little better. So from here, from here, from here to here is a sarcomere. This is the sarcomere of a relaxed muscle and of a contracted muscle. So the first thing we recognize is with contraction, the Z-bands come closer together. That is, the sarcomere shortens. So contracted muscle, short sarcomere, lengthened muscle, large sarcomere. They recognized that there was no change in the width of the A-band. So this portion, from here to here, tended to remain the same, visually. But that the I-band got smaller. Hmm. All right, so how do we explain that functionally? Well, 
To explain that, let's go back and look at the organization of these cells. So here's the actin molecule. The actin molecule consists of uh, a, a protoglobulin, round structures that are kind of linked together, kind of like the uh, beads, right, to form a longer filament. Still thin relative to the thick filament. The thick filament, or myosin molecule, is composed of a number of myosin molecules, which are characterized by a filamentous end and then a very large globular head. So let's look at that in a little more detail on plate 23. And here we see the same So here's the same kind of diagram blown up. Here's a, here's a, a, relaxed, a relaxed muscle. Notice the distance from here, from he, here to here, sarcomere, is greater than here to here. So the, with contraction, the sarcomere is decreased in size. This area shows the relationship of the myosin and actin molecules. Recall that the myosin molecule consisted of a filamentous end and then a globular end. Well, if you stack these so that the filaments all tend to congregate on one end and then you oppose them in the opposite direction with another set of myosin molecules, you will find that you will have a molecule that is very thick on the ends and relatively thin in the middle. So this thick filament, which is composed of all these myosin molecules, in fact, from here to here is the A band. But remember we talked about the H band? Well, that's that area that's in the middle that trans transmits a little bit more light. Well, transmit a little bit more light because there's not as much nuclear ma or proteinaceous material there. Those are all filamentous ends where the globular ends are opposed. So here's an enlargement of one of those relationships. This is showing the, the actin molecule, okay, made up of all these globular subunits. And here's a myosin molecule. And they've truncated it. This is the portion of the, the, the myosin molecule that's relatively filamentous. But notice there's a globular head right here. And this globular head is interacting with the actin. So let's look at the uh, let's look at the the elements of the uh, the contraction cycle. Now they start down here with uh, number, uh, contraction cycle number one. But let's go ahead and uh, we'll start here on number seven. All right? So this is where the actin and myosin are already fused. Okay, so like up, in the, up before we had, here's the myosin molecule. There's a bond between the actin and the myosin. In fact, this is a covalent bond. This is, this is a pretty tight organizational relationship. And in order to break this bond, you need energy. So in fact, ATP comes into the process. And it is ATP that dissociates 
the actin from the, uh, the myosin. So th it shows breaking the bond. And what else changes? Notice the shape of this globular head. It changes. And it comes back into a, into a well, conformational change occurs, right? So it's differently shaped. It still carries the ADP and inorganic phosphate with us. It turns out that this is not the energy consumptive phase. It needs ATP, but it, it doesn't release the energy from the phosphate. However, it can rebind with the actin, and when the myosin binds to the actin, you get a change in shape and you can see that it's going from this shape to this shape. Now if it's going from this to this and it's bound right here, that's going to move the actin and myosin molecules relative to one another. So all of the movement we're getting is the change is, is coming from the change in the myosin head when it binds to the actin. Where is ATP? Where does ATP get burned up or appear in the process? Right up here. That it is the ATP energy that drives the contractile process. So when we say it's an active process, we know ETP is involved, but in fact the ATP comes in here. It's not consumed here. It's not consumed to, to break the bond. It's consumed to contract the muscle. So it is a cyclic phenomenon. You need to have AT present to break the bond, and then the reformation will trigger the next reaction. So as long as ATP is present, this process will continue. So a prolonged contraction is one in which ATP is present for long periods of time. Now if we look back up, So we have some heads that are going like this, some that are going like this, some that are going like this, some that are going like this. All right, so there's, there's a thick filament. There's the H region. Now, if these heads all are attached to the actin and they all move this way, and these all move in this direction, and they're attached to the actin, what are they going to do? They are going to shorten the sarcomere. So we need to have the actin and myosin bound to one another, and we need to shorten it in this fashion. So let's talk about the whole process now. We need ATP, we need actin myosin, we need their physical relationship to one another. And now what we're going to do is we're going to put a, uh, we're going to trigger that contraction. And how do we do that? So here is plate 24. You have the muscle cell up here. Here's the myofibril. So again, this is a muscle cell. You see that the organelles, the, the representation of the A and H bands is, is preserved in the whole cell as it is because it's a construct of the individual myofibrils. Again, very, very carefully regulated. This shows the myosin on the bottom with the globular heads reaching up, and then it shows the actin molecule. Well, life becomes a little more complex. The chemist got involved and said, well, you know this thin filament, which is composed on a large part of the protein actin, these globular proteins, actually has some other proteins associated with it. 
And I'm going to name two of those. One is called tropomyosin, and the other one is called troponin. So if you look at the actin molecule, it is a, it's a helix. So that it consists of two filaments of actin that wind around one another. And in the groove lies another protein called tropomyosin. So there's the tropomyosin molecule. You can see it's kind of lying in that groove in the, actin, in the two actin molecules. At specific distances along the tropomyosin is another protein called troponin. Troponin binds to calcium. So calcium is going to come into a major play. So, so where, does, where, where is the calcium coming from? Uh, how do we orchestrate this into a contraction? The stimulus for contraction is going to come from an action potential. We've already talked about neurotransmitters. So this diagram down here shows you the input of the motor neuron. Motor neuron comes into the muscle cell. This is the motor neuron plate. So there's the presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes. Acetylcholine is released. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft, binds to acetylcholine receptors on the skeletal muscle, and produces an excitatory postsynaptic potential. So remember, you could have EPS and IPSPs. Well, the neuromuscular junction is only excitatory. As you can't, you can't inhibit the muscle, you merely make it not contract. That makes sense? You don't produce a hyperpolarization at the end plate, you produce a depolarization. So if you don't want the muscle to be on, you turn the action potential off. You, you have the motor nerve not working. So now what we're going to do is we're going to send an action potential down. It's going to release the acetylcholine. It's going to cross. It's going to cause a depolarization in the postsynaptic membrane. And the thing about the sarcolemma is, like an axon, it transmits an action potential. So it is an electrically excitable membrane. It propagates an action potential. That action potential is propagated throughout the muscle. So let's look a little bit at the anatomy of this, which may help us. And they do a better better job than I can. So here is here's a, a cartoon view of the muscle fiber. There's the sarcolemma that wraps up. You see the individual myofibrils. You see the nice relationship of the A band and the I band, and there are the Z bands. So there's a sarcomere from there to there. This is the motor neuron, and look, oh, it's got a, got a myelin sheath on it. And it comes into these synapses. So the action potential is coming down here, generating an action potential in the sarcolemma. And the sarcolemma transmits this action potential along the length of it. So general, well, generally, you, you only have one neuron per muscle fiber. Only one input. And it's somewhere on the muscle. Remember, it's multinucleate. It can be long. It can be in the order of centimeters. And this information, this electrical information, has to be transmitted along this axon, or along the sarcolemma. So the action potential is propagated along the sarcolemma. This, the electrical signal goes this way. It also travels by channels called T-tubules. These aren't holes. These are more like invagination. So there are the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know, if you stick your finger in him, the, the, the surface membrane of the doughboy kind of dives down in. So you're, you're not disrupting the membrane. Uh, 
you still have extracell and intracell, but what you have done is you have created and moved some of that membrane deeper into the inside of the, of the muscle cell without perforating the cell. Now, it increases the surface area of the sarcolemma, but it allows the access of this action potential to dive down and travel down these membranes to uh, the inside of the cell. Well, inside of the cell, inside of the muscle cell, are, is the organelle, which in an in a archetypal type of, of cell would be called an endoplasmic reticulum. In muscle cells, it's referred to as sarcoplasmic reticulum. So sarcoplasmic reticulum are organelles, membrane-bound organelles, that contain material. In the case of skeletal muscle, sarcoplasmic reticulum contains large amounts of calcium. So you need to make the distinction now between calcium, which is high external environment relative to the internal environment, and the calcium inside the muscle cell, the intracellular calcium. Intracellular calcium is lower in a muscle cell than extracell. But what calcium is there gets sequestered, held and packaged, if you will, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So think of the sarcoplasmic reticulum as being little sacs, little sacs of calcium that lie inside the cell. In the resting state, the calcium is sequestered or held within the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But what happens is a action potential causes a, well, it must cause a conformational change, causes a change in, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and increases the permeability to calcium. Okay, can I keep this straight? Okay. Calcium is high extracell, but in the muscle cell, what little calcium there is intracell is sequestered in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It lies there. If you increase the permeability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum to calcium, calcium will move out. So let's kind of go to our... So here's my muscle cell. Calcium is higher on the, on the outside. Here is an organelle inside the cell. There's calcium. Now, the amount of calcium inside the cell is less than outside the cell, but there it's concentrated. If I change the permeability of this membrane to calcium, where does calcium go? It doesn't go outside the cell. It's still contained within the muscle cell, but it goes outside, if you will, of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's going into the sarcoplasm. Cytoplasm of a cell, sarcoplasm in a muscle. Well, what's out in the sarcoplasm? Actin and myosin. So what you have done is you have taken an action potential from a nerve, you have transmitted it along the sarcolemma as another action potential. You have changed the permeability of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, allowing calcium to move out to interact with the actin and myosin. Remember which protein was involved in calcium binding? Troponin. So the calcium binds the troponin. The binding of the troponin and calcium causes a conformational change to occur. They pull the tropomyosin out, exposing binding sites on the actin for myosin. So the actin is sitting there in, in an 
a non-stimulated state, its ability to bind with myosin is disrupted. You don't get that bonding because you've got tropomyosin blocking the sites. The only way you can get rid of, the only way you can move the tropomyosin is by having calcium bind to troponin. So implicit in this, in order to get a muscle contraction, you must have calcium. Without calcium, the muscle will not contract. The other component that's involved in contraction is ATP. So you need ATP, you need calcium. What happens when you die? When you die, all of your ATP runs out. When did we use ATP? We, we used ATP to break the actin-myosin bond and to power a contraction cycle. So we can't break the actin-myosin bond and we can't get a contraction. Well, what else is happening? Well, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which holds the calcium, no longer is functional, so it starts breaking down. That releases the calcium. So now there's lots of calcium. Tri calcium binds troponin, exposes the binding sites. You can get a binding of actin and myosin, but you can't get the release. So you now have a rigid structure of actin and myosin that's not in a contractile state. That is, it's not shortening, but it's solid, rigor mortis. So it's exactly what we have. No ATP to break the bonds, no ATP to power a contraction, but we've got calcium out in, out in the sarcoplasm because we can't control it anymore. That emphasizes the importance of calcium reuptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So, in order for relaxation to occur, you must decrease the calcium available to troponin. Well, the only way to do that is to move it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That is an ATP requiring process. So ATP is not only important in breaking the actin myosin bond, it's and powering the contraction cycle, it's also important in pumping the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, again, in order for relaxation to occur, you need to get calcium out of the system. You need to pump it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's an active process, it requires ATP. Calcium gets removed, troponin and tropomyosin move down to cover the, block, the binding sites. How do you get actin and myosin to release. You need to have ATP. So in order for relaxation to occur, you must have ATP present and decreased calcium. In order for contraction to occur, you have to have ATP present and you've got to have calcium. So the big distinction in that process is the presence of calcium. The trigger for its release is an action potential. An action potential causing the release of acetylcholine. So the way we turn off muscle function is we stop the action potential. If there's no action potential coming down the nerve, there's no action potential on the sarcolemma. There's no action potential on the sarcolemma. Calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum close. So it's a wonderfully orchestrated process that requires an action potential to be there if you want contraction to occur. And if you don't, you shut the action potential off. So all of the components are there and all functioning. 
It's an expensive process. ATP is used in the contractile process. It's also used in pumping calcium back in. The process of calcium pumping is occurring all the time. It's like it's cycling. During an excitation, during a contraction, a lot of calcium is present. A lot moves out. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a break.